it to start and we'll have more people joining us. Uh, firstly, hello everyone, a very warm welcome to you from the Sankal team and IntelliCap. And thank you so much for joining us in the new online format of Sankal Virtual 2020. Uh, I welcome each of you to our session today. We have a very exciting session planned for you. Uh, the Every Woman, Every Child Innovation Marketplace and Ecosystem Approach to Collaborative Impact Investing. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to you know, thank our partners, uh, the Grand Challenges Canada, for putting together this session. And uh, just before I quickly hand it over to them, a few housekeeping rules to bear in mind. I request the audience to keep themselves on mute and their videos off during the course of the panel, but definitely use the chat to introduce yourself, share questions, comments, anything. Uh, so now without any more delay, I hand it over to Deepika Devdas to take this forward. Over to you, Deepika. Thank you, thank you, Trina. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our session. Uh, I'm Deepika Devdas, your host and moderator um, from the Every Woman, Every Child Innovation Marketplace. And uh, for those who may not know us, uh, we are a collaborative initiative um, of development innovation funders at Grand Challenges Canada, together with the Gates Foundation, USAID, and the Norwegian Agency for Development. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this uh, initiative was really set up as a mechanism to support uh, innovations in the health space that have already received seed funding or grant funding to test their ideas and now require the capital to scale proven solutions uh, addressing the health of women and children in low and middle income countries around the world. So the marketplace's role here is to select a portfolio of impactful innovations and then provide hands-on support to our entrepreneurs as they scale their businesses and ideas and leverage our really strong network of over 400 relationships with the investors, funders, and scaling partners to create win-win opportunities in the ecosystem. Um, next slide, please. And to give you an idea of what that means in terms of the uh, indicators or KPIs we monitor, we have mobilized 42 million in financing for innovations in our portfolio that are cumulatively addressing the needs and demand in 62 countries. And most importantly, through our conservative research-based methodology, we estimate these uh, social enterprises to be saving and improving the lives of over 500,000 women and children. Um, our approach is a uh, collaboration across the ecosystem, which is why we are here today. We bring a uh, blended finance from the funding level, which is how it's more traditionally thought of, down to the company level, where based on the scope of activity, investment return and impact mandate, we hope to mobilize various forms of capital for these companies that help them truly be impactful and successful ventures, um, leveraging blended finance in a more unique way. And uh, moving to the last slide, our panelists, because uh, our hands have certainly been quite full during these last few months, um, as our focus on health have naturally aligned us with um, addressing COVID needs. And we dare say the interest in collaboration has been incredible, something I hope will continue beyond this pandemic uh, circumstances. We will have the opportunity in this session to hear from both sides of the table, so to speak, in the requirement for and the advantages of collaborative impact investing. But before we begin, we'll, we'd like to conduct a really quick poll of this audience to understand the sector makeup. Um, you should shortly see a poll on your screen. Excellent. I'm going to give it a few more seconds to see most of our audience is voting. Fantastic. 
Fantastic. So we're seeing this uh, really great mix here and uh, really um, a good um, um, prevalence of entrepreneurs, which is what we always like to see. So without further ado, I'd like to call on our uh, first panel of uh, really incredible and innovators within the marketplace, both Sorry. Um, yeah, who are, sorry, I, I don't know if I'm unmuted now. <laughs> Perfect. Um, yeah, our, our really incredible innovators who are at various stages of being with us, who have compelling business ideas for the health issues we seek to solve. Um, they're really a unique group that can share with us uh, various insights from their experiences of uh, growing their own business during this pandemic. So I'm going to go around a sort of round robin, virtual round robin, and ask each of you to briefly introduce yourself and your uh, business um, for the audience. Uh, starting with maybe uh, Steve Adidans from Hevatele in Kenya. Over to you, Steve. Yeah, thanks, Deepika. Um, I think this is a wonderful session. Uh, my name is Steve Adudans, uh, Chief Executive for uh, Hevatele. Uh, Hewatela is a social enterprise um, coming from a Swahili word meaning plentiful of air. And uh, Hewatela is a uh, medical oxygen generation, distribution, and utilization um, ecosystem builder, um, fully owned by a not for profit called Center for Public Health and Development. And our focus is to see how to improve access to affordable and safe oxygen um, in uh, sub Saharan Africa. Uh, through a, pu a public-private partnership model that has allowed us to um, impact at least the lives of uh, 30,000 people. We're currently based in Kenya. Uh, happy to be here to share uh, some of our experiences, especially during this time of COVID. Over to you, Deepika. Wonderful. Lovely to have you, Steve. Next up, we have uh, Emilian Popa from Ilara Health. Yes, hi. Thanks for, uh, for having me here. Um, so I'm, I'm the founder of a company called Ilara Health. Um, at Ilara Health, we bring uh, more affordable, accurate, and accessible uh, diagnostics to uh, primary care facilities located in the outskirts of the main cities in, in Kenya. So in a nutshell, we take the, um, the lab, the centralized lab concept that we, that we know, uh, and we break it in pieces and we decentralize it. And we place those small, portable, high-tech uh, cloud-based devices on the desk of uh, clinicians in those small and many, many fragmented medical centers located in the outskirts of the cities, um, targeting uh, you know, the, the three to four killers, uh, meaning the um, metabolic, so um, um, diabetics, um, diabetes, cardiac diseases, um, um, cancers, and a few other diseases which actually make 60 to 80 percent of the deaths in in uh, in uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. We're in about 150 clinics today, and we add about 40 every month, and we keep adding uh, new devices as they uh, as we grow the business. Excellent, lovely, lovely to have you as well. Uh, over to Patty White next from Hemex Health. Hello, everybody. It's great to be here. I'm uh, Patty White, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer and the co-founder of Hemix Health. Uh, we're based in Portland, Oregon, in the U.S. Still waiting for election returns, though. So don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> Glad I didn't stay up all night waiting for them. Um, I've been working in medical technology for the last uh, 25 years, and actually, this is my third startup. And uh, we started Hemix Health uh, in 2016 really to bring breakthrough diagnostic technology that's targeted for low resource settings. And uh, we have a platform approach. And basically our focus is to take more uh, advanced technology that's low cost like consumer electronics and AI and be able to make a product that's affordable, powerful and easy to use. So we've launched our product this year. Um, not an easy year to launch a product, but we're excited about the traction we already have. And our initial product is focused on the diseases of malaria and sickle cell disease. So we're really excited for the impact we can have probably in sickle cell for every hundred children that we test, we can probably save one life by early diagnosis. So 
it's really excited and glad to be here and hear from everybody. Excellent, great to have you, Patty. Um, and on to another technological innovation uh, from Pratusha Reddy from Nemo Care. Hi all, uh, super excited to finally make it to the session. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm Pratyusha and I'm co-founder of um, Nemo Care Wellness. We are based uh, out of uh, Hyderabad and Bangalore. Um, and we are a company that's focused uh, towards building um, advanced technological diagnostic solutions for improving the lives of newborns, especially in the developing countries. Um, so the genesis of the idea that we are working on was born out of the fact that, uh, you know, 3.6 million premature babies are born in India and a lot of them um, actually do not make it because of the lack of very basic equipment that is required to identify distress conditions in these newborns and that can be addressed um, in a timely manner. Um, so we started building uh, devices for to enable healthcare workers to be able to identify these distress conditions in um, premature and sick newborns uh, early on so that timely intervention can happen. Our first product, which we call Nemocare Raksha, it's a, it's a cloud-enabled uh, IoT-based device which can simply be hooked onto the baby's foot and can uh, measure six clinical vital parameters and uh, has the capability to identify distresses like apnea and hypothermia and respiratory distress. Um, what we are building uh, towards is to make this, um, you know, um, uh, to be able to actually predict these distress conditions before they actually, you know, um, happen in real time so that the nurse is well prepared. Uh, we are also building this solution in such a way, especially for countries like India, uh, in such a way that it is low cost and it is um, able, we are able to actually uh, monitor multiple and many um, newborns at this at the same time so that uh, and, and, and trying to make it um, easy to use for the healthcare workers so they can actually um, kind of give their attention at the right time and um, and it's it's basically simple to use, though it's high end tech. Um, so that's that's our first product. We are under clinical trials um, currently, and we're excited to see where it and where it can go and how it can actually save more lives. Thank you. Wonderful! How very exciting! And certainly, last but not least, uh, Nayan Kalnad from uh, Avigen Health. Thanks, Deepika. Lovely to be here. So my name is Nayan Kalnad. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Avgen Health. We are based in India and in the UK. At Avgen, what we have been doing over the last four or five years is building a patient management platform that is used by health, primarily by healthcare providers. And uh, what the healthcare providers are able to do is introduce patient applications, and the patients are able. We are able to empower the patients by sending them information that is contextualized to their condition. So we work, our, the areas that we primarily work in is maternity care. Mainly what we're looking to do is how do we actually improve the overall quality of antenatal care in India by empowering the mothers and giving them the opportunity to actually give feedback on the care that they, that they provide. Um, also on the back of it, we've sort of expanded our ambit to other long-term conditions. So the platform is also used to support patients who have had a, my, a heart attack uh, in, pul in a rare disease called pul pulmonary arterial hypertension. And obviously, you know, uh, through COVID, we have actually been supporting some of our providers in offering more out of clinic care to patients who have either had COVID or are recovering, recovering from, from COVID. Uh, the platform today supports little more than I think 100,000 patients and uh, it's used by providers in India, in UK, and a few other uh, uh, developed countries like Ireland and Belgium. So lovely to be here, looking forward to sort of, you know, hearing the experiences also from the other panelists. Great, thank you Nayan so much. And uh, it's it's really in true Sankal fashion that we have this uh, uh, panelists of entrepreneurs from uh, both India as well as Africa. And, uh, Maybe we'll just get right away started, but uh, I wanted to make a little uh, pitch to the audience to please uh, put in any questions you have. I'm gonna get started because I have a few, but uh, feel free to put it, put yours in the chat. 
Um, maybe we'll start uh, with you, Steve, given we're talking about the pandemic. Um, first of all, congratulations on your Rotman Innovation Award, um, but especially given oxygen, uh, yeah, and its uh, demand during COVID. Can you take us through how your business has risen to that need, um, essentially a business opportunity as well? Uh, thank you, Deepika, and uh, we are very humbled to uh, have been awarded the inaugural uh, Rotman um, uh, Innovation of the Year Award uh, through Grand Challenges Canada. I think um, um, uh, we have been have had a steady growth in our business, especially with um, support from uh, Grand Challenges Canada. Um, and uh, one of the critical things that we've had to understand right now during COVID is mainly um, um, understanding the company. So in terms of how do you make it much more efficient because oxygen um, has gained a lot of traction more than ever, uh, uh, you know, the breath of, of um, an individual is much more important, not just when a, a baby is born, but right now, COVID has made it much more important that every single breath should not be taken for granted. And therefore, oxygen has gained a lot of center stage. And therefore, for us, it's been very critical to understand how do you make oxygen production much more efficient? And uh, how do we ensure that at least um, oxygen is not a privilege for those who actually can afford? And that led us to be able to look at uh, some outcome-based financing models. That, uh, that we can be able to put into place, like uh, approaching uh, folks like GCC um, and, and other people like UBS to see how do we, um, you know, put outcome outcomes um, to be part of those things that can be financed. And we looked at uh, increasing access to oxygen. And with that, we were able to see how we can acquire more cylinders so that uh, we, can, we can have more patients get oxygen at a much more affordable rate. Uh, the other thing that was very critical for us to understand, especially during the COVID, is the fact that there is a difference between um, a customer and a consumer for a, a product. So for us, oxygen, uh, the customer is a health facility. The health facility buys oxygen from us. Uh, but the customer, the consumer rather, is a patient. So the patients who are consuming the oxygen um, may not necessarily be buying directly from us. And therefore, we had to understand how do we ensure that the, consume, the customer that who, is, who is a hospital or the facility is able to give the patient the uh, an oxygen in a safe manner. So things like minimal piping, masks and tubings had to be there so that uh, the patient gets oxygen the right way um, and those are some of the small little investments that we had to think of from uh, from production to to consumption of of you know of the of the product or of oxygen. Lastly, I think is is a competition. Um, it's been very very competitive. Um, uh, a lot of um, uh, manufacturers, especially for devices, uh, have been. Um, you know, swamped with a lot of requests and things like that. Even manufacturing oxygen cylinders, we were ordering cylinders and it took us almost uh, over three months to get them because of how manufacturers swamped. So, so that has uh, led to a couple of delays and we had to devise mechanisms to, uh, to ensure that uh, we are able to meet the demand for oxygen within um, you know, within within the country, and um, and we were able to optimize um, consumption of oxygen by training more healthcare workers and ensuring that we have around the clock shifts in our oxygen plants, um, and um, and that enabled us to be able to um, at least see how to adapt to uh, you know to the shortages we have. So many shifts, and and to ensure that at least we we utilize that which we have to ensure people do have oxygen, um, you know, when they need it. Um, so, so those are some of the things that um, have given us the, the downside and the upside of, 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 of business, especially during this COVID. Uh, but demand has been, is on the rise, um, and especially right now in Kenya, we're having a second spike of, oxygen, of uh, COVID cases. So, so oxygen demand is even increasing and increasing. Um, yeah, thanks, Jipika. Over to you. Yeah, no, that's that's uh, super interesting. And maybe I have a quick follow up question to that. I mean, you touched on it a little bit, but um, um, maybe just seeing this this really crazy demand that is uh, increasing. What today would you say are your limitations in meeting that demand, uh, you know, internally versus um, external factors? 
Yeah, so so internally, I think one of the critical challenges is, um, uh, you know, uh, the the oxygen plants need to be very very efficient and ensuring that we have access to uh, parts and consumables for ensuring that the oxygen plants run e efficiently because this is, this ones we have to get them from the manufacturers. So so ensuring that we are able to have a good preventive and corrective maintenance schedule for the oxygen plants. Um, similarly, also ensuring that we also have enough oxygen cylinders uh, to be able to do uh, fewer shifts so that we don't have the oxygen plant running um, around the clock. So, so this will require capital. We need to, we need capital, we need, we need funds, we need money, uh, whether it's in uh, debt or, or grants that we're able to ensure we get this access to this, um, um, you know, parts. Uh, for for maintenance and also more cylinders to be able to uh, service um, the demand. Uh, externally, I think uh, some of the challenges you're facing is uh, not every facility actually is able to utilize the oxygen safely. So we've done our math and doing um, uh, minimal piping with a manifold. The manifold is like an um, you know, oxygen cylinders put together at a facility, um, either in series or, or in parallel, um, is able to provide oxygen around the clock for patients without the need for electricity. That is able to ensure that the patient is able to get oxygen in the remotest of places. So, so ensuring that facilities are able to have that minimal piping ensures that we are able to increase access to oxygen and able to utilize. And lastly is, uh, there's need for more advocacy uh, because oxygen has not been, um, um, you know, uh, recognized as um, as essential medicine by a lot of uh, domestic governments in sub-Saharan Africa. And therefore, uh, right now, it's uh, when a lot of budgeting that therefore can be can be done by domestic governments to put oxygen aside in terms of um, uh, funding and financing to ensure that uh, every patient who needs oxygen can be able to get it. So, uh, so that that coupled with a very strong public sector engagement uh, from both donors and um, and the public sector, so that it's easier to uh, to do this business as as a private entity. Over to you, Deepika. Helpful, helpful, Steve. Thank you. Um, and maybe uh, shifting gears a little bit to talk about medical devices. Um, many medical device companies, uh, both from our portfolio and otherwise, have certainly had it a, a little hard in our experience. And uh, maybe I can call on you, Patricia. Um, would you be able to speak to any such clinical trial or regulatory challenges that you've seen in these last few months? Um, and, and perhaps, you know, how have they evolved uh, given we are now 10 months into the pandemic? Yeah, so um, initially uh, at the start of the pandemic, it was uh, quite hard because uh, we were completely thrown off the track and we were all trying to figure out um, how this could work and, and the guidelines for the safety and the protocols kept changing almost you know every week. Um, so obviously the hospitals uh, and the companies had a hard time trying to um, fit this in. A couple of um, major issues that we have dealt with is the, the first one is that um, the entire study um, that was happening at a certain site uh, slowed down drastically because obviously um, we had to ensure uh, there were changes made to the protocol to kind of um, build in more safety measures. And, you know, we uh, there were uh, complete uh, visitation uh, uh, protocols had completely changed and obviously the staff from the company were there was this severe uh, limitation and um, you know ban of uh, any sort of um, uh, visitors in within the hospital that was completely um, gone and uh, uh, at uh, centers where uh, neonatal care was not the primary um, branch or the primary um, care um, caregiving um, department uh, they had drastically uh, brought down their volumes. They, they were not admitting any non-emergency cases. So um, that sort of uh, kind of uh, uh, caused a lot of delay to the, the way the um, study was progressing. Um, and we also had other issues uh, with respect to the fact that uh, we were not able to supply any clinical um, trial material. There were a lot of import delays. So we were dealing with the equipment that we already had within us to kind of, um, you know, uh, manage with that. Um, so there was, there was this also that was happening. Um, the other thing, other important um, issue that we had faced was 
the fact that um, the entire importance had shifted to COVID related uh, medical services. So the hospital was just concentrating on that. Um, the IRB, especially the internal review board, which had to review our uh, uh, clinical data at uh, timely intervals was now um, not taking it up on priority because they had other uh, COVID related issues to deal with. Um, so these were the major uh, issues that caused the delay and um, had uh, uh, completely put us uh, off the track with uh, clinical trials. Uh, and one thing that became completely impossible was the fact that we had to initiate clinical studies at two new sites, which now was not happening within this year, uh, because uh, already initiated sites were still trying to take it up on a, on a slower basis, but at least, uh, but the new sites were not uh, willing to initiate new studies because they were working already with very limited staff. Uh, so they had to, uh, you know, put all their staff in other departments and other COVID-related boards. So they they were operating on very limited resources within um, um, maternal and neonatal departments. So that took uh, a major hit. Um, so the one thing that uh, kind of was good for us the, was the fact that since um, we were not able to be on the site to be able to monitor our data. We fast-tracked our entire IoT platform work, so we were able to monitor that data from home. So we had to enable that piece of the um, of the of the device. So we had to um, so that kind of um, helped us actually fast-track that work, and we were able to monitor that data from home. Um, we had to build in uh, new protocols in terms of the sanitization of the devices and other um, the PPEs that were being used and uh, the amount of uh, data that was collected on a single baby uh, on a given date. So all these uh, smaller uh, issues had to be built into the protocol and we were trying, we were able to get through with that. Um, so that was the one way we were dealing with it. Um, the other- yeah. uh, Pratisha, I just wanna make sure that there's uh, time to go around. And I, I know on, on that medical technology question, uh, I also wanna get uh, Patty's view on it because uh, you know she's she's been dealing with uh, uh, a malaria diagnostic in, in India in a similar way. Um, Patty, do, did you want to chime in to what Pratusha's uh, uh, experiencing here? Sure, I could definitely relate to a number of the themes that she brought up uh, with doing the medical devices, especially something with hardware. It can be challenging. And we were um, waiting to get our, we do a lot of work in India. First of all, we do uh, development work there. We do clinical trials and we do all our manufacturing. So for those of you from India, you know, things shut down very fast, very early. And uh, luckily we were able to get about 20, 25 devices out before the factory shut down that we could get to the US. But um, our regulatory was just going through, we had approval for sickle cell and we were going through on uh, malaria. And of course the India FDA pretty much, it shut down at first no one was coming. And then when they opened up, they were really focused on COVID only. And so we kind of got in a long line. And I think as uh, all the entrepreneurs can relate, you have to figure out how to be unstoppable. You know, <laughs> so in these times you pivot, you move, uh, you know, we, we were not gonna be able to get it through, but we were able to um, take our team and really focus on, since we weren't all traveling like we usually are, we got a lot done on the product development. Our, our data is all digital. So we had a lot of data from, you know, we'd had 10, clinical 10 sites up doing clinical studies, we were able to really analyze that data, you know, and continue to improve our device and actually started working on a COVID diagnostic that really created an, a whole new platform for other, many other tests that we will be able to bring in. And we're, we're still getting very closer on this COVID, but whether we get COVID or not, we'll be able to use it for other things. So mm -hmm. I think you kind of have to make the best, I think all of us mm -hmm. situation then. We've done a lot of trainings over Zoom. We've now sh shipping product uh, to places in Africa, training, uh, finding really great partners. Um, we're excited to work with Emilian and the people at Ilara to be able to do a pilot there. And so, you know, just trying to take advantage of other opportunities because, you know, COVID's still there. And I think we're all still being impacted to some extent. Um, and we just try to make absolutely. the best of it. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, Speaking of uh, opportunistically, I think I, I want to get to Emilian as well. Um, 
you've been having some really great success with, I want to say, a relatively large uh, financing round. And, and these are certainly challenging times. So what tips would you give in how to raise investment in such an environment? No, thanks. I think, look, I think there, there are a few things here. One is, uh, uh, one is the trend, the healthcare itself. And, uh, uh, you know, two, three years ago, I remember I was on the investment side and there were not many healthcare technology companies on the continent in Africa. Uh, but there are not many investors either investing in healthcare, and this has changed dramatically with COVID. I think COVID was, is being, has been the catalyst of, of many healthcare, health tech companies uh, popping up on the continent in emerging markets in general, and more money invested. Um, I think the second thing is the, the, the model. Um, so building healthcare, healthcare in general is, you know, is, has been seen as, as a non-profit uh, area, as a government or, or subsidized or, or NGO subsidized area. Um, I've seen more and more companies, um, including ourselves, building for profit models. Um, so showing that, you know, they, they, there is a profitable way um, uh, to build healthcare technology in, in Africa. Um, um, so solving a massive need, but profitable. Um, and the way we look at it is really we look at a world of uh, the power of non-consumption. So when I started Ilara, there was, you know, I looked at those looking at labs. There's no labs in those areas. Um, so uh, I guess a lot of companies looked at it as, you know, there is no labs, there's no diagnostic, there is no need for diagnostics. Why should we do diagnostics? But we looked at it at a different way, try to bring, to bring affordable diagnostics. So creating a new, well, there is a need, but bringing a product to match with that need. And I think this, this applies to any venture, healthcare or not healthcare um, during, uh, during crisis mainly. And I think the third thing is, is that the team. Um, you know, we, we, we have a, a great team. We, we've never stopped actually building the team or fundraising. And fundraising is not happening during the crisis or, or in a non-crisis time. It happens, I mean, founders need to fundraise continuously, you know, keep uh, um, you know, relationships with investors. And this helps uh, uh, mainly in, in, in periods of crisis because then in, you know the investors who still put money in ventures will probably put money in 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 better teams right right no that that's absolutely true and uh, you know as as uh, ilara is this interesting mix of uh, um a bit you know business model innovation and a lot of their digital as well digital is another thing that we've seen has really picked up um, during COVID, and uh, maybe that's a good um, segue to bring in Nayan into this conversation about um, how having an, a digital platform has really increased uh, applicability um, that you've seen during uh, COVID. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can only I think, echo what Emilian has said. I think COVID has definitely been a catalyst from an adoption perspective. Uh, you know, before COVID, uh, when we used to speak to healthcare providers, uh, there was obviously a minority that understood how digital can actually help them scale care care to the patient closer to where the patient is. But but we had a lot of like convincing to do. Uh, with COVID, I think that that has completely flipped. Uh, for example, we work with one of the largest sort of uh, public healthcare providers in Bombay, and they approached us because, uh, you know, given that all to face had stopped, they had 20,000 patients that they needed to reach out to, and technology was the only way that that they could actually reach out to all of these, all of their, all of their patients. So I think from our perspective, what's happened is I think digital is now considered mainstream, and uh, all of these organizations in very very quick time have change their pathways to be to be more digitally aligned or to leverage the you know the benefits that digital platform can can bring to their uh, their their care their care delivery um, i guess our hope is i think this change that has that the pandemic has brought uh, some of it will obviously revert i think but most of them i think will just stick around and we'll probably truly have healthcare systems that are leveraging technology to better care to their patients. Great. 
No, that's that's uh, super helpful. And and another um, element I'd like to highlight is, you know, again, we we come across uh, the promise of uh, dual market strategies, uh, especially for impacting uh, bottom of the pyramid, uh, lower income populations. Um, but can you speak more generally to Avigen's uh, sort of dual market strategy in, in terms of the Indian and the British markets? Sure, absolutely. Uh, I think um, when we when we started working in digital, I think there was definitely a concept. There's a preconception that digital technology can only benefit, you know, the the more affluent in society. Um, as a company, I think we were quite passionate and keen on how can we get the benefits of digital platforms to also, you know, uh, patients who come from the lower socioeconomic segment. Uh, so. Um, so and that I think in COVID has become evident. What's been very gratifying for us over the last six to eight months is that we are starting to partner with NGOs who traditionally, you know, have focused on having feet on the ground to support their patients, and they are actually now transitioning the way they are reaching out to their, you know, uh, clients in a tech using e technology. Um, and what's been interesting for us to see is, you know, technology by nature is global, it's scalable, uh, but a lot of the times, I think technology only in either the developed countries or or in or or for the the more affluent in society. So we have been in that way, I think, privileged that we've been able to roll out this technology platforms in India, really sort of test the platform out while also rolled out in, in, in UK. Um, and from that perspective, we're able to offer a differential pricing in India. So, and while benefiting from, 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 the, from the scale. Um, so I think uh, uh, it, it's sort of best of both worlds, right? I mean, you, you get the best practices from both countries. You have, you know, healthcare providers and patients from both countries using it. And you truly get the benefits of digital, not just for the event, but across the whole social spectrum. And I think uh, today our platform is used in you know at least three, four developed countries and, and multiple states mm -hmm. states in India. So that's where I think the dual con dual market strategy has helped us test the platform and also have a business model that makes the company more viable. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nayan. Thank you very much. Uh, we really, unfortunately, won't have too much time for Q&A, but uh, I'm going to just pass one opportunity to Steve, who, where I've seen a question pop up about the oxygen pricing. Uh, and if you wanted to quickly get to that, uh, we'd, we'd love to do that. Yeah, thanks, Deepika, and thanks, Rin, for the question on the chat box. Um, oxygen essentially uh, for majority of places is um, uh, distributed using cylinders and the cylinders are made of steel and uh, companies that uh, uh, put uh, oxygen in compressed cylinders usually uh, uh, charge uh, at a cost of, for deposit and cylinder leasing fees. Uh, this is to ensure that they do not lose the cylinders. So what we have done to ensure that um, the cost of oxygen is not high is remove the cost of cylinder deposit and cylinder leasing fees and cylinder um, uh, distribution fees. So we deliver using a milkman model, we deliver oxygen at the doorstep and remove uh, those other fees and just charge the cost of oxygen. This allows oxygen to be affordable uh, for facilities. Over to you, Deepika. Thank you, Steve. So clearly you're seeing innovation in every form from digital to technology to business models. And uh, that's what we'd, we'd love to continue seeing. Uh, thank you so much panelists for sharing more about uh, the, the work you do. Um, and now to quickly move on to our next panel, um, we are going to call on some really wonderful partners that the marketplace has had the pleasure of working with. Uh, these are organizations who will all invest in impact through their own strategic priorities uh, and investment vehicles and play an even bigger role uh, through the collaborative ways in which they work. Um, it's my pleasure really to invite these four panelists to introduce themselves and their organizations. And uh, maybe first up, I'll call on Philip Jordan from the Welcome Trust. Thanks, Deepika. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, so I'm a partner in the innovations team at Welcome. Uh, for those who don't know Welcome, it's um, one of the 
five largest uh, health charities in the world based in London, uh, really focused on improving health. Um, it awards approximately a, a billion pounds a year, um, greater than 50% of this is in sort of uh, discovery research, but also uh, significant commitments to product development, um, working on culture and society policy and, and specific areas of interest such as drug resistant infections. I know we're a bit rushed, so I'll end there. All good, all good, perfect. Um, great, and then next up we have uh, Audrey Obara from Sweat Fund. Good afternoon, my name is Audrey and I lead the healthcare investments at Sweat Fund. We invest in Africa and Asia and I've put my, uh, you know, our focus there so you can always reach out for more details. Excellent, thank you, Audrey. Um, also, we have uh, Mukesh uh, Sharma from Mentera Group uh, in India. Hi, I'm the co-founder of Mentera. We are an investment fund focused on addressing the biggest issues facing agriculture, healthcare, and education in India. Uh, using private investments that target commercial returns and big sectoral impact. A few of the participants here have interacted with our incubator Will Grow in India and Africa. And our investments in healthcare are focused on uh, increasing access to affordable care while improving the health outcomes. Happy to speak further. Over to you, Deepika. Thank you. Thank you. Very exciting. And again, uh, last but not the least, we have uh, Pompey Sridhar from Merck for Mothers. Hi, everyone, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm the India Director for MSD for Mothers. It's Merck's uh, initiative to prevent maternal mortality. Um, That's a 500 uh, million US dollar investment. That's a 10 year commitment. Thank you. Excellent, great. And I'm going to get started here with uh, some questions I'll post to them, but please again, continue to put your questions in the chat uh, function. Um, and maybe starting with you, Philip, uh, of course we, we see Welcome as a really important uh, early stage funder for new innovations. Um, can you maybe get into what distinguishes Welcome in terms of the type of uh, stage, the entity, and the types of activities uh, that you like to fund? Sure. So, I mean, Welcome's in a hugely fortunate position to have a, a large endowment and no living founder. Um, this gives us uh, a lot of independence and the opportunity to take risks. Uh, and we traditionally focused at the sort of very early stage of uh, product development. Um, but we've, we've been interested in, in sort of how we can actually achieve patient impact because it's all very nice to fund early stage things, but then where do they go? Um, right. So we're, we're very flexible in our approach, uh, fund program related investments to universities, uh, startups, uh, PLCs, um, you know, through, through a range of mechanisms and they can be over, you know, anywhere between uh, very small amounts and up to 20 million pounds. Um, but what we're trying to do is the moment is take a portfolio approach to problems and this is really making several investments in an area uh, to reduce the risk of, of individual failures and to allow uh, entrepreneurs individuals to to sort of learn from each other in an area um, so we can sort of uh, fund activities that complement it but also allow for information sharing um, and in successful cases uh, fund uh, you know provide long-term support to, to some of those uh, initiatives um, so we see we support entrepreneurs pre, during and, and post the award, um, you know, internally, we provide a lot of product development and business development expertise. Um, but it's not easy to be an early stage funder and also focus on impact. And so that's why we have to collaborate a lot. Um, and, and this collaboration occurs all through that sort of cycle. Um, you know, it's, it's either using our broad networks to sort of um, provide advice and introductions, um, but also you know, getting a really deep understanding of what follow-on funders may want to, to, to give uh, or may want to see in order to take something on and, and sort of support that themselves. Um, so in an example in India, we, we funded a lot of awards around affordable innovations uh, with uh, DBT. Um, but after that, we've worked with Gates and DBT to provide an entrepreneur boot camp uh, to, to help those companies grow and also to provide access to Gates to, to those entrepreneurs and think about things that they may want to scale. 
Um, so I guess for us, collaboration is sort of key in, in terms of finding our place in, in uh, the ecosystem and um, being able to uh, get products from the beginning all the way through to actual impact. Yeah, super helpful. And that's that's really, you know, the speaks to the spectrum of uh, investments. Uh, Malcolm is really able to support and, and especially with its uh, collaborations as well. Um, maybe over to you then, uh, Mukesh. Um, uh, you know, we, we're talking about the growing uh, investor community in India. Um, could you maybe uh, describe the, the types and the numbers of local players, uh, especially in the areas of uh, impact and health um, that, that we should all be aware of? Yeah, so when you, when you talk about healthcare, I think in, if you look at numbers, numbers are small, right? It's a, it's a sector that has, uh, you know, seen traction and activity pretty much in last, I would say, five, six years, maybe going up to 10 years. Bayrak itself is less than 10 years old, uh, just completed 10 years. Uh, uh, and many of the incubators, accelerators created around it are, are not very old. So there's a growing set of local incubators and accelerators that provide initial project funding, uh, R&D and technology development support. Uh, there are quite a few large mainstream and impact focus fund that provide funding for scaling the proven business model, but there's missing middle in this continuum. So there's lack of funding between those two stages, I would say. If there's an initial promising idea, you will have a lot of, lot of project funding coming. Uh, and once the business model is viable, there is enough funding available. The startup value of death for most startup has at least three chasms to cross, not one. And with clinical and regulatory approvals added, healthcare startups have at least four chasms. Right? So lack of visibility on clinical and regulatory pathway and lack of follow on capital and exit makes the very few early stage and impact funds wary of investing in healthcare. Mm -hmm. So there are very few investors with enough expertise and aligned pools of capital to underwrite the med tech risk. Uh, uh, there are even fewer who are able to and willing to take clinical and regulatory risks. And because of that, you see uh, uh, you know, more interest in health company that just require capital to go through scale but before that you see a lot of lot of gaps right. yeah and, and maybe you know touching on that a bit um i know for example grand challenges canada is very conscious about uh, our approaches and funding uh, especially thinking about the conversations around decolonization and so on um how what what role i think is um should the international stakeholders really play in leveraging the work um, amazing local players like you are doing in creating and enabling local ecosystem? What's, what's the role that uh, global players should look to play? Yeah, so I think first we to start by acknowledging that the idea to scale continuum is not fully built. And historically, there has been a sector with very low capital allocation. So there are stakeholders playing across this continuum are operating in silos. So uh, more capital and resources are needed and there's an equally big opportunity of making the existing efforts a lot more efficient, targeted and outcome linked. So uh, Biosense is a company that you would be aware of, Deepika is a good example where a college dorm startup was supported and scaled through local incubators from Wilgro, incubation from Wilgro. Mentira provided equity funding. Artha from Switzerland provided equity funding. There was a grant funding from Ecoing Greens, Welcome Trust, Grand Challenges in Bayrek, and they were blended instrument from the Lemelson Foundation. Vadwani Foundation supported initial trials. So some of it was structured and co coordinated and some of it was not. So we need to create a continuum to deliver this kind of support and collaboration across several enterprises. If we leave it to just specific transaction, then, then I think we would still take, take much longer to address many gaps and, and make this continuum really function for, for all the promising companies. Excellent, excellent example really in terms of, uh, you know, making it happen at that sort of innovation level and what are things we can put in place in the ecosystem to ensure more of that uh, coordination, absolutely. Um, maybe my next question then is to, to Pompey really in terms of, uh, um, 
such sort of collaborations, what are maybe the type of stakeholders, uh, Merck for Mothers, a more uh, pharma sort of company wants to see uh, in supporting its goals in maternal health particularly? Um, where, where should this come in? Oh, you're on mute, Pompey. Thanks, Deepika. For us, uh, you know, it's, we are in the ninth year uh, of our work um, uh, across the globe and in India. And, uh, you know, it's been a very fascinating and fulfilling journey. We do a gamut of, um, you know, um, uh, philanthropic uh, investments ranging from grants all the way up to commercial equity investments and debt investments. And so depending on the stage of the program, as well as the solution, the required financial instruments are used. So we collaborate across, um, you know, um, uh, you're starting with the government and primarily because uh, we are focused on quality improvement, we partner with professional societies, health providers, uh, folks who fund these health providers, nonprofit organizations, quality uh, improvement experts, um, legal experts, because all of this is really required. We require an ecosystem approach um, when we are, uh, you know, looking at incubating solutions as well as sustaining them in the long term. Thanks. Absolutely. It's, it's really about that uh, spectrum. Um, Next up, maybe a question for Audrey, uh, and I know you've got into it a little bit on the chat, but if you could spell out, um, you know, what, what are uh, Sweat Fund's investment criteria? And um, as a DFI, really, can you comment on its uh, relation to the risk appetite in terms of stage and maturity of, of um, entities? So Sweat Fund invests in... Um... We, we are financial minority investor and we invest growth capital. So this is capital that would be used by companies for expansion. You've tested your business model and now you want to grow either within your markets or you want to grow into you know, a new country. And typically we would invest between five and $10 million for a minority stake of not more than 25%. So you know, if you work backwards, you're saying these are companies were valued at $100 million. How many healthcare companies do you have in Africa, for example, that are valued at $100 million? They're not very many. And so, you know, because of that, we, we, we are starting to explore uh, working through intermediaries and also looking at um, either small markets for companies that would be deemed to be high impact. Um, and, and so sort of coming a bit further down the value chain, if I could put it that way. Uh, instead of waiting for these companies to get to, you know, $100 million valuations where a sweat fund could come in, you know, with our typical stakes. Um, our risk appetite, uh, it varies, but we, we weigh a number of things. We look at uh, financial viability and sustainability. We look at environmental and social sustainability, and we look at development impact. And we weigh all these three pillars. And so we are flexible in our approach. We are flexible in our instruments. We are uh, flexible in the return we expect. So we also count impact as part of our return on, on investment. Right, and that's that's um, usually um, a, a priority for other impact investing groups uh, like yours. And so that's um, looking at that impact piece also becomes very much part of that uh, pie that, that we invest in. Um, maybe a follow-up question to you, but also to uh, Philip and Pompey. Um, for those that uh, are managing portfolios that span uh, Africa and Asia, for example, what are uh, some perhaps cross learnings, differences uh, and opportunities that uh, folks should be aware of? So I think in terms of cross learnings, we see a lot of a lot more innovation in Asia. And, and so um, and we have recently invested in a fund that looks at early stage companies in, in India specifically. And we do want to see how can we collaborate with this company and our portfolio in Africa, because some of these things have already been um, tested uh, in, in India. So instead mm -hmm. of starting from scratch in Africa, are there are ways that our portfolio companies could tap into some of these solutions from these companies and how can we support that ecosystem? Helpful. Um, over to you, maybe Philip, and I'll come to you as well, Pompey. Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I mean, to echo a lot of that, uh, it, 
a lot of it's about creating the connections and seeing what comes. A, a lot of it's driven by the entrepreneurs. Um, you know, th th there's obviously huge differences between, you know, cultures and health systems between Asia and Africa, but even within in, in those very broad areas. Um, and so it's, it, it's, it's for us, it's about how do you connect them and make sure that they have the opportunity to learn from each other. Um, and I, I think increasingly also with digital and data, you know, th there's, right. there's opportunities to bypass a lot of sort of uh, things that have happened in, in sort of more well-developed uh, health systems. And, and there's the opportunities there are, are sort of pretty much limitless. And so basically getting those people in a room. So for very small amounts of money or, you know, very limited time on our part to create those introductions, uh, I think can have very large impacts. Absolutely. And then the VR marketplace also loves to play that sort of introductory role where we can see some of those synergies uh, happen. Um, over to you, Pompey, on, on uh, you know, learnings from spanning Africa and Asia. So thanks for that question. Um, so as we evolve, we are now, uh, you know, getting into more deliverable based or performance based grants, even if they are grants. And of course, uh, equity and debt instruments have their own um, terms, um, which are sort of market uh, terms, um, but maybe, um, you know, we kind of backstop them or hedge the risks. But when we, um, you, know, you know, the deliverables and performance-based contracts, we see folks uh, generally jumping over the fence. So they do all that is required to achieve that particular objective, which is not sometimes really the objective of a development initiative. So very often development initiatives are around social behavior, lasting change. It's about adopting quality culture. And so, uh, you know, we've been focusing on that, uh, you know, systemic change and ecosystem support, good governance, as in any corporates and strong MIS system. And that to me is uh, are the core pillars for sustainability and scale. Great, very helpful. And, uh, you know, I'm not seeing too many questions really here in the chat, but, um, Perhaps an open question to all um, in the context of uh, collaborative ecosystems, uh, which is our point today. Um, what support would you say your uh, portfolio investee or company should uh, ideally have uh, maybe before, uh, during or even beyond your investment or support to them? I have you on my screen, Pompey, so we'll start with you. <laughs> Sure. So, uh, so for us, uh, you know, alignment with uh, country objectives is foremost. Uh, and if there is alignment, there will be market and there will be sustainability. You know, it, it, the solutions have to infuse sustainability from the start. And so we start talking about minimum viable products the moment, uh, you know, a solution kind of solidifies. And we have to productize these uh, development solutions and, um, you know, get them to the market. Um, and, and that's, I think, the most critical piece. Uh, so from development and grant funded um, programs to markets adopting it, uh, there, is, there is a full management of change that is required. It's about scale, about sustainability, governance, about funding that comes in. Uh, but at the bottom and the core of this is cost effectiveness operating margins, transaction costs. And I think everyone needs to kind of think like startups. Absolutely. Um, Makesh, uh, anything you would add to that? No, I think I can just replace Pompey's name with mine and pretty much <laughs> pretty much the same thing. But yeah, for us, defensibility uh, in the business that we are we are supporting is extremely important and the impact objective. So just put our, our uh, impact objectives there. So if the impact objectives are not aligned and it's not a defensible business, then we wouldn't be able to look at it. So it's important to uh, define the value that is being delivered and it, that value should also be captured in the financials of that business. Many times you can deliver value but not capture it. So as an investor, that won't be exciting. What do you typically? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, panelists. Uh, this has been so uh, incredible. And I uh, dare say, speaking on behalf of uh, everyone here, very informative. In uh, 
understanding both from you know the entrepreneur's perspective about the kind of opportunities uh, uh, or rather how to opportunistically um, you know seize the day and uh, really speak to um, uh, their very focused approach on the goals uh, on health and impact uh, as while they grow their business and uh, from from the ecosystem of investors we've seen here today you can see that uh, openness to to supporting um, portfolios from that comprehensive uh, collaborative point of view so i hope you all are as inspired as i am and um, and have enjoyed this these two panels as well um, that's all from us really thank you so much for joining uh